28 through 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who, are, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Good morning. It's so good to be here this morning, and I want to just say thank you at this time for the opportunity to come and speak before you, and I hope to bring you some encouragement this morning. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to go ahead and turn over to Matthew 11 and look at verses uh, 28 through 30, and we're going to be looking at that in a minute, but before we look at that, I'm going to start with a question. Who do you go to for comfort? Where do you go to for comfort? Maybe it's to a spouse, maybe a friend, a mentor, maybe a parent. In, in this life, we all deal with stress and anxiety. We deal with fear and pain, shame and guilt, and even sin. And we need comfort. And we typically seem to turn to our friends or our family or a mentor which is good, and as, as members of Christ's body, we have that obligation and responsibility to do so and to look out for our fellow family members and Christians and even all the members of this world. However, this morning, I want to use this lesson to remind all of us that Jesus wants to be our comforter. So we're going to go ahead and look now at Matthew chapter 11, starting in verses, verse 28. We're going to read again. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Throughout these three verses, we can see three clear commands that Jesus gives to us. And the first command is found in verse 28. Jesus says, Come to me. But this begs the question, why is Jesus calling us to himself? And even the people of, of that day, why was he calling people to himself? Well, when Jesus begins his ministry, the Jewish people are oppressed. But not only by hundreds of years of captivity behind them, they have the Roman government ruling over them harshly. And on top of all of that, their own people, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, scribes, and elders of the people, who the Jews should have gone to for guidance, were overbearing and harsh the the people that the jews should have turned to that for their spiritual guidance were the ones turning the people away because they said they couldn't follow the law correctly but when jesus comes on the scene he teaches as one having authority matthew chapter 7 and verse 29 tells us and instead of bashing the people for not being able to follow the law and the traditions of men Jesus flips the script and he calls the people to himself. But then this leads us to the question, who is Jesus calling to himself? First of all, those who labor. He said it himself. Jesus knows that the people want God. They want to be in a relationship with God. They know their history. They know of the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They know of Moses and Joshua guiding the people through a foreign land with God's help. They know of David and Solomon and all of their power and wealth and glory. But then they also know of their bondage and captivity that their people have faced for generations now. The Jewish people were looking for a Messiah, were looking for the Messiah, and they were looking for a way back to God. And although they looked for an earthly ruler, Jesus was right there in their midst telling them to come to him for rest. He also calls those who are heavy laden, those who are burdened. Jesus knows exactly how harsh the religious leaders are, having to be constantly bombarded by their questions and attacks daily. And like I said, those religious leaders should have been the ones who the people turned to for their spiritual guidance, and yet they were the ones turning the people away. And Jesus calls them out multiple times for their harshness and hypocrisy, explaining that the people are burdened and that he wants them to come to him. 
Jesus is God, and he wants to show the mercy and love of God. But how do we come to Jesus? Well, it starts with sincerity. Look at Psalm chapter 24. Psalm 24, looking in verse, verses 3 and 4, the psalmist says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy hill? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, nor swear deceitfully. David says that we must go to God in sincerity. We must go to God with clean hands and with a pure heart. And it's in sincerity that we can go before Jesus, and we can go to Jesus for comfort. And we need to know that we can go to Jesus for comfort because he said it himself. He'll give us rest. Jesus is not just telling the people that they can come to him. He's also reminding them that he'll give them rest from their heavy laden, and, or the, from their burden. He's making sure they know that they can find rest in him. And this was one of the goals of Jesus, was to remind the people that they can come back into a relationship with God. Throughout the Old Testament, uh, God is seen as different types of uh, strong, uh, 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 of, uh, he's seen as a refuge, a rock, a fortress, and a shield, a stronghold. And in the Psalms alone, God's referred to 84 different times by those five different things. God's referred to as a refuge 37 times in the Psalms, as a rock 16 times, as a fortress 13 times, as a shield 12 times, and as a stronghold 6 times. All of these different things are used for protection and refuge and comfort because they are strong and they have strength in them. And the Jewish people needed this reminder. In the New Testament, the phrase, the God of peace is used, is found seven times. And six of those times, Paul uses that in his letters. You think Paul ever needed peace? <clears throat> he persecuted Christians, and then God used him as an instrument for his kingdom. You ever consider that Paul may have come face to face with some of the Christians, the family members, the spouses, the parents of those who he had sentenced to die? And not only that, Paul then became very outspoken for the cause of Christ. And because of his willingness to serve God, he was then persecuted for that. Look now to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians 11, when Paul is defending himself, he goes through and starts listing all the things that he has suffered for the cause of Christ. And starting at the end of verse 23, Paul says he was beaten near death five times, he was stoned. He was shipwrecked three times. He was adrift at the sea a night and a day. He was in danger from rivers and robbers, Jews and Gentiles. He was in danger in the cities and in the wilderness. He was in danger while at sea. He was in danger from false teachers. He went without sleep, without food, without water. And on top of all that, he says he is anxious daily for the churches. Paul needed peace, and he knew God was his peace and his comfort, which he tells the Ephesian church in Ephesians 2 and verse 14. God is our peace, and Jesus is our comfort. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on and gives us a second command. Jesus says to take up his yoke in verse 29 of Matthew 11. But what does it mean to take up a yoke? Well, a yoke is typically used to bring together two animals to work together as one. And in David Roper's Truth for Today commentary over the life of Christ, he points out that in Scripture, a yoke is typically used in a negative sense. But Jesus uses this idea of a yoke in a positive way as reminding us that he will take on the undesired load. <clears throat> He'll make sure that our yoke is easy and our burden is light. But how do we take up this yoke with Jesus? Well, it starts by imitating him. Taking up a yoke with Jesus means that we are working side by side with him. But we're also, and, and sometimes we try to do our own thing, and that, that gets us messed up along our way. A yoke is pointless if one is not cooperating with the other. We have to work alongside Jesus, but also recognizing that Jesus is our Lord and Master, and that he lowered himself for our sake. 
Jesus is a gentle master, like he told the people of his day. And like I said earlier, he is contrasting himself to the religious leaders. One way that we can take up the yoke with Jesus is by imitating him, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, and Ephesians 5 and verse 1. But then this leads us into the next question. Why should we take up the yoke with Jesus? Jesus knows exactly what we're dealing with, and that's why we should take up the yoke with him. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 reminds us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. And this is a comforting passage, reminding us that Jesus came to this earth, was tempted exactly as we are daily, dealt with the things of this world daily, and yet he remained blameless in the sight of God. Jesus is taking all the heavy and weighty parts of the yoke, and he's placing it upon himself and making our burden light. So we've come to Jesus and we've taken up the yoke with him, but he gives us a third command, which is to learn from him. We can't just come to Jesus and take up his yoke and expect everything to be fine. We also have to learn from him. We have to learn gentleness, first of all. Jesus was and is our help and strength, and the King of kings, the Lord of lords, master of everything, shows us gentleness when we don't deserve it. He has the right to be harsh, And yet he's not. And the people of Jesus' day needed, needed to hear this. And I believe we need to hear this too. We need to understand that Jesus is not a harsh master. And that he is wanting us to come to him. It also requires humility. We also must learn from Jesus' humility. In Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8, Paul discusses how Jesus lowered himself for our sake. And when we recognize that Jesus, who has a right uh, not to be humble, humbled himself, it makes you get a little lump in your stomach, a little lump in your throat, thinking about how much he loved us. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, Peter reminds us that we are to let God exalt us. We, we should not exalt ourselves. We need to let God exalt us. Learning gentleness and humility will help us to come to Jesus and to take up the yoke with him and to learn from him. But why should we learn from Jesus? Well, the answer is simple, because he'll give us rest for our souls. Jesus is our comfort and our strength, and he wants to give us comfort and rest for our souls and for our burdens from this life. There's some of the things in this life that Jesus gives us rest from specifically, though. First of all, he gives us rest from our anxiety and our stress. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6 and look at verses 25 through 32. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spent some time discussing anxiety and stress. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Or about your body, what you will put on? Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them all. The people of Jesus' day dealt with a lot of anxiety and stress and a a lot of anxiety and stress. And anxiety, stress, and depression are huge problems in our world today. And in the past, we've overlooked and downplayed them and pushed them aside. But Jesus is reminding us that he'll give us rest from such things. Next, Jesus also reminds us, or Jesus also gives us comfort from our fear. 
The people of Jesus' day also faced so much fear with the Romans who were ruling over them. Not too long after the church began, they were persecuted. And because of this, Jesus had been preparing his disciples for what was to come, which was the persecution. In the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus reminds his apostles that he will be with them always. And when they faced imprisonment and beating and torture and even death, they could look to Jesus for comfort. They could see Jesus as their comforter. And we can too. We all deal with fears on a daily basis, but we can face those fears with Christ as our comforter. Next, Jesus also gives us comfort from our temptations. As I mentioned earlier, the Hebrew writer reminds us that Jesus was tempted exactly like we are, and yet he was without sin. Jesus knows what tests and temptations that we go through daily. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, Paul says that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide you a way of escape that you will be able to endure it. We can take comfort in knowing that Jesus knows what we deal with on a daily basis and that he provides a way out of those temptations. And finally, Jesus gives us comfort from our guilt and our sin. In Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12, one of the most comforting psalms, the psalmist says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. In the Old Testament, the priests would be the ones who, sac who would offer the sacrifices to God. But Jesus came down and became our sacrifice for our sins once and for all. And Jesus gives us comfort from our sin. He's wiped our slate clean, and we can go to God blameless because of that. Thank God for the peace and comfort that he, that Jesus gives us from our stress, our anxiety, our fear, our guilt, shame, temptation, and sin. So Jesus gave us these three commands to come to him, to take up his yoke, and to learn from him. We should seek comfort in Jesus, but it requires sincerity and humility and gentleness. And we must learn these attributes from Jesus. We must be gentle as Jesus was. We must be humble as Jesus was. And we must be sincere in our efforts to learn from Jesus and to go to him. You know, we often read this passage and just think, what an encouraging thought. But I want to encourage you to truly look to Jesus for your comfort this week. To maybe spend some time in prayer with people or with God. And to read your Bible and look into what God has spoken to us. Our world deals with so much of this pain, this anxiety and stress and all of these, these fears. But Jesus has said he's our comforter, and we can look to him because of that. This morning, maybe the cares and the worries of this world are holding you back from looking to Jesus for comfort. Maybe your fear or your guilt or your shame is holding you back from going to God and seeking Jesus for comfort. When you can't seem to get away from your anxiety or your stress, shame, fear, guilt, sin, turn to Jesus and let him be your comfort. Do not underestimate the rest that Jesus can give you for your soul. Go to Jesus, take up his yoke, learn from him, and you'll find rest. This morning, if you need to come to Jesus for rest, you have an opportunity to do so right now as together we stand and we sing the song of invitation.
Let us close our worship this morning with prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, in Christ Jesus' name, we come before you with open hearts, thankful that you've given us the command to meet together to worship you on the first day of the week, that we can remember you, we can be with you, we can be with each other, and remember who we are because of the love that you give us each and every day in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for everyone who's here this morning. Thank you for the calling you, you've given each of us, the hearts that are open and willing to receive your call and, and seek you out diligently and, and share that with one another and, and with the world as, as you continue to teach us through your word each and every day. Father, thank you for Jonah's message this morning from the words of Jesus who makes himself available to us willingly that we may be reconciled to you, have a hope that we otherwise would not, and have a purpose in this life to be with you in heaven once again one day. Father, as we continue to go about our schedules this day and this coming week, we pray that you continue to be with us as you are each and every day, that we'll remember you want us to come to you, and that every time we do, it's a blessing for us to do so. Father, thank you for these things. Please keep us safe until we meet again later tonight. All these things we pray in your son's name. Amen.